In the last video, we studied a number of different bus cycles and looked at what was being shown on these status lights to tell us about those bus cycles. One of the cycle types we didn't get to look at was the interrupt acknowledge cycle, and that's what we're going to study here today. Now when an external device interrupts the 8080 processor, the first thing the processor does is finish any instruction it's on, and then if the interrupts are enabled in the processor, the processor initiates a bus cycle called an interrupt acknowledge cycle. In an interrupt acknowledge cycle, the processor is expecting the interrupting device to put an opcode onto the data bus. And then the processor will execute that opcode just like it would have had it fetched one from memory. Now you may be thinking, what good is a one instruction um, interrupt service routine? You can't get much done in that. And of course, that's very true. However, the 8080 has a number of instructions geared specifically for calling interrupt service routines. Uh, when an interrupt acknowledge cycle executes. They're called the restart instructions. There's restart 0 through restart 7. These are essentially one byte subroutine calls and they can be used that way but they were intended primarily for interrupt service entry. The restart 0 instruction essentially does a call to address 0. The restart 1 opcode does a subroutine entry at octal address 10. Restart 2 enters at octal address 20 on through restart 7 which enters a subroutine at octal address 70. Alright, so we're going to watch this on the computer today. We have a simple program in here that utilizes the serial ports interrupt ability to generate interrupts for us. We've got it set up so that when I push a keyboard, uh, key on the keyboard, the serial board will receive that and generate an interrupt to the processor. Okay, already got it loaded in memory here at zero. Let's just single step through it to begin with. We're going to just initialize things first. Now the first thing it's going to do is load the stack pointer with octal address 40. So there's our act out, excuse me 400. There's a low byte, there's the high byte. We have to load the stack pointer because the restart instructions are subroutine calls that are going to push return address information onto the stack. All right, the next thing we're going to do is just initialize the serial board in here. This is just go through this quickly. Uh, the 3 is going to reset it. Here's our actual write output to the serial board controller that resets it. Next thing we're going to do is uh, write this data to it. This is going to actually enable receive interrupts. So here's the actual output to that device. Now the hardware has interrupts enabled for whenever a character is received. All right. If you notice right now interrupts are not enabled. None of this will do us any good until we enable interrupts in the 8080 processor. So the next instruction is the enable interrupt instruction. Now the 8080's interrupt flip-flop is set and interrupts are enabled it will respond to interrupts. Now we fall into a simple idle loop that just goes round and round in circles. Ours starts here at octal address 14. It does, doesn't really matter what it does. This is a no-op, another no-op. Now this is a jump instruction which is going to jump us right back to octal address 14. And now we're back to 14 doing the no-op, no-op, and then the jump. Alright, round and round in circles um, we go just doing nothing. This is our idle loop. Okay, so nothing will happen until we get an interrupt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to single step right here into the middle of the jump instruction. See, it's not a memory fetch. We're in the middle of the jump instruction where it's fetching the data. I'm going to type the character 0 on the keyboard. At that instant, the serial board in here has received that character and has asserted the interrupt line to the 8080 processor. So at this point, the interrupt line is asserted on the 8080 processor. Let's see what happens. Nothing here. It's still just fetching the high byte now of that jump instruction. Why? It's because it has to finish the current instruction before it handles an interrupt. All right. Ah, now we see it's jumped back to 1.4 like we expected, but it's not doing the standard opcode fetch from memory. It is now doing an interrupt acknowledge cycle. Interrupts have been disabled as part of that. This is not a memory read. So memory will not respond with an opcode. However, it's still an opcode fetch because the M1 light is on. And the interrupt acknowledge light is on. So this shows us that we are doing an opcode fetch. That light is on. But it's not from memory. It's in response to an interrupt acknowledge cycle. All right, so the address is basically ignored because memory isn't even enabled. All right, so what opcode is the serial board putting on the data bus? It looks like all ones. That doesn't look like a good sign, does it? Um, the reality is the serial board is not putting an opcode on the data bus. In fact, virtually none of them did. Uh, 
they don't respond at all. What what does that mean on the Altair? Well, in the Altair, the data in bus is pulled up high when nothing's driving it, so the CPU is going to get all once. Uh, well, this isn't going to work then. Well, actually it does because there is an opcode that is all ones. That opcode is the restart 7 instruction. So by design, the restart 7 essentially becomes the default interrupt entry address because when nothing responds, you'll tend to get all ones. All right, so in reality, we have put a restart instruction on the bus, the restart 7 instruction. So we should be jumping to octal address 70. So let's see what happens. First thing we notice again is that interrupts are now automatically disabled. And now we're doing a write to stack. Well, this isn't what we thought, is it? Well, it is. If you think about it, the restart is a subroutine call. It's pushing the return address onto the stack. We were at octal address 400 for the stack, so it has decremented that one to 377. So there's the one byte of the return address, 376. There's the other byte of the return address. Ah, now we're to a standard opcode fetch. We can tell by those three lights, and we are at octal address 70. So we have entered our interrupt service routine. I've got an overly simplified routine here for this demo. This is simply going to read from octal port 21, which is the serial port's data register. As soon as this read executes, which it's done right here, that removes the hardware interrupt request to the 8080. And you can see right here I typed a... Um, an ASCII zero on the keyboard, that's what that data is we're looking at. All right, so at this point that it has read that data out, the serial board has actually removed the interrupt request. So now it's safe for us to re-enable interrupts in the processor. It's up to software to do that. So this is the uh, interrupt enable. Interrupts are now re-enabled, and now we can exit our service routine and go back to normal processing. This is a return instruction, just like for a subroutine. And here we can see we're back onto the stack doing a memory read from stack, getting the low byte, high byte, and then we're right back where we expected. We're back at that 1.4 in the middle of our no-op loop. No-op, no-op, jumping back to 1.4. All right, so that was a full interrupt cycle where it uh, interrupted an idle loop, jumped to an interrupt service routine, cleared the interrupt, and went back to the idle loop. All right, let's do something interesting here. In the middle of this idle loop, here we jump back to the first no-op. Here's the second no-op. I'm going to put that strange halt instruction. All right, so that's a one, six, six, and I will deposit that into that location. All right, so we execute that instruction, and we're into our halt state that we've seen before. The data bus is floating, the address bus isn't being driven, and we're halted. And at this point, nothing seems to happen at all. You know, what was the point of this instruction? Well, the point of the halt instruction was essentially a idle loop. You could execute the halt instruction. The processor is now idled, doing nothing, but it is still going to respond to interrupts. So, in other words, when we generate an interrupt, it'll automatically exit the halt state, process the interrupt, and be back in our loop, which is going to jump back around to the halt instruction again. So, let's watch this. All right, so, again, we're just stuck here in the halt state. I'm the type of key. Okay, what happened? We're doing the opcode fetch and an interrupt acknowledge cycle. This is our interrupt acknowledge cycle. But this is a special one in that it's from a halt state. So when you see the halt light on, interrupt acknowledge, opcode fetch, this is entering the interrupt service routine for an interrupt, but you came out of the halt state. And you'll see this is identical to what we went through before at this point. It's pushing the return address onto the stack at 377, 376 and now we're executing at octal 70. So we're completely out of the halt state. All right, so here we're gonna read the data port to get the zero I typed out. At this point, the interrupt has been removed by the hardware. I'm gonna re-enable interrupts in the processor and do a return, so it gets it from 376 and 377, and now we're back into the middle of our program. Here's the jump going back to address 11, and at that address is our halt instruction, and we're halted again. So that's actually another way to do a um, idle loop, is just have a halt instruction in it. Interrupts will always exit that and do exactly like uh, you would expect, as if you had an idle loop that was just jumping around in circles, but not halting. 
All right, in the next video, we'll actually see this running and echoing characters for us on a um, terminal. Now, the computer used in the video today is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately, um, du accurately duplicates the look and the feel, the features and performance of a real Altair 8800, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. This makes it more affordable and reliable than trying to keep a vintage computer running, but it also lets you use it without having to worry about damaging a museum quality or collector's quality piece of equipment. It's just a great way to re-experience this period in history, just hands-on without having to worry about it. Be sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this great computer.